Welcome to Family Matters. I'm Justice Harvey Brownstone, and on this episode, we will be talking about something that has always amazed me as a family court judge. Everybody knows that the divorce rate is almost 40% in Canada and almost 50% in the United States. And that's just the people that get married. We don't even know what the breakup rate is for couples who just live together in common law relationships, but I'll bet it's even higher than 50%. And yet, very few couples enter into contracts before getting married or moving in with each other. Why is that? Today, we're going to be talking about cohabitation agreements and marriage contracts, commonly referred to as prenups. What is a prenup? How do you know if you need one? What should it say? And are they really enforceable if you break up? These are the questions we'll be exploring today with the help of our expert guests. Let's meet them. First, we have someone who started out as a public school teacher for 10 years and for the past 19 years, he has been a family law litigation lawyer. Please welcome Mr. Lee Gagnon. Thank you so much for being here. Joining Lee is a lawyer with 23 years experience who practices corporate commercial law and commercial litigation, Mr. Ron Dumonceau. Thank you so much for being here. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here, taking time out of your busy practices. I've got to start with this burning question, Lee. What made you switch from teaching to law? Well, it's a bit complicated. Uh, well, give us the simple version. I think I was just looking for a new challenge. Uh, after being 10 years as a teacher, I think I found I was getting into a, a bit of a routine, even though the kids changed every year. So I think I went out and I wanted to go back to school and law seemed like a good uh, fit with what I used to do. I did a lot of debating in high school and university and stuff. But isn't it interesting that you went into family law after teaching? So you've obviously had a child-focused career. Yep. And Very now much I must like children. I have to say that I'll bet you some people and maybe a lot of people watching this broadcast are wondering why we invited a corporate commercial lawyer to come here and talk about a family law issue. Um, Ron, why would uh, you have anything to do with family relationships? Well, what people don't typically understand when they get together in a, in a romantic relationship is that they're not just forming a romantic bond, they're also forming an economic unit. Uh, they tend to throw their lo economic lives together and they tend to acquire assets together. They tend to make spending plans together and essentially just run their economics as if they're a single unit. And because of that, the, they are a partnership for a, almost any legal sense you want to talk about if you were talking about a commercial situation. So it's a, a relationship, in things. your professional world, a relationship that most people see as a romantic thing, um, unless they're in it for the money, just keeping it real, <laughs> unless they're in it for the money, a relationship to you as a lawyer, putting on your lawyer's hat, is an economic partnership. Well, but it doesn't seem to be a conscious decision for a lot of people. Well, it's not, and that's, that's the, why people don't, generally speaking, think of it that way. They, they do these things almost organically. When they get together, they just decide. Organically? That's they one just, way to put it. Yeah, they just decide to do things, and they, uh, they make their decisions based on what they jointly see as being the best interests of them. But is there anything wrong with that? Do either of you see... I mean, you're not saying it as, as if there is anything wrong with it, but isn't that the way it's supposed to be? Oh, I don't personally think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, I, I, I think it's actually quite natural for people to do so. Uh, but the issue isn't that. The issue is, is approaching it when you're uh, forming your relationships is to have at least the idea of what you're going to do about it. Like, have the idea of how these things are going to work. I think one of the problems when people get together, it, it is so much about love and romance. They don't realize that they are indeed forming an economic union. They don't realize the fallout if down the road they separate. It would be great if there was education courses that were mandated. This is what you have to do, this is what you have to know before you get married or before Welcome you Welcome to Family into. Matters. <laughs> That's what this is. I mean, I mean it. I mean, there's, there's, it's no accident that one of the first episodes we are filming in this series 
is prenups mm -hmm. because it is so important. And it's refreshing to hear two lawyers from normally one would consider very different areas of law working uh, on this, this issue. And I just wondered what percentage of your practice deals with drafting prenups for people? Well, it's actually quite a small percentage. I'd say maybe 10 to 15 percent come in because it's really not something that's known out there in the public. It's usually some people who have assets to protect or have gone through a, a marriage first time, it's a second marriage. Those are the people that show up in my office saying, I want something in writing before I go forward with this person. And do they, uh, Ron, do they come to you too? Yeah. Or do they get referred to you by a family law lawyer? Most of the ones that I typically end up writing are they're commercial clients of mine already or they're related to commercial clients of mine and they come to me through that, uh, that way. Oh, um, so some business client yeah, the, whose child is about to get married or maybe about to get married themselves or, or are going to live with somebody yeah. says to you, how do I protect my empire? Yes. Uh, they, Does they, anyone ever come to you and say, my child's about to marry uh, a very wealthy person. How do we get our claws into that, that empire? Uh, never put me that way. Uh, no, uh, I've never well, I don't actually... I want to give anybody any ideas, yeah. but... I've never had anybody come to me with the idea of how do I get into it. Uh, it's always about protecting when, they, when I deal with the clients. They always come to me because they have something to, come to uh, protect. And it's not just the individual businessman. As you said, it might be a child of the businessman or it might be uh, someone that they, they know. Because I'm dealing so much with business people, they do see things more economically. And they, they're generally speaking older and have been dealing with economics for some time. So do you, do you think that people who come to you uh, to, to want to protect their property are telling you that they're worried about the relationship? I don't see it that, is all, uh, that at all. I think what, they, what they're doing is they're making intelligent decisions as to what they want to have happen as opposed to having just things happen. Okay, um, so we've got people... Let's break it down for people. You have a client coming into you saying they're about to either live with someone or get married to someone and they want a prenup. Can you explain for the public what is a prenup? What exactly is its purpose? What's in it? What's it about? Well, a prenup can, is any kind of agreement that you enter into usually prior to marriage. A legal contract. It's a legal contract. And what you're trying, it's a bit of crystal ball gazing. First of all, you have people say, I have this and I want to keep it. The other person may say, well, I have this and I want to keep it. And it's agreement that says in the event of separation or in the event of death, this is what's going to happen to our assets and our liabilities and how we're going to deal with it. So you're, you're trying to look ahead and say, well, what happens if? So this is a contract entered into by two parties who are embarking on a relationship that deals with their property in the event of either the death of one of them or if they break up. Have I got that right? And I mean, they could even go down further. You can get down into the very nitty gritty about, I will take out the garbage every Tuesday and Thursday and you'll take out the garbage every Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Now I mean, you tell me. <laughs> you, you, you can get very detailed, but most, most of it deals with property and, and, and children. Well, that's what my next question. Children, can you, uh, if they haven't even ha got children yet, can they tell you, can they agree on who's going to get them if they should break up? Well, they can agree, but whether or not that would hold up in court is another question. You would probably, as a lawyer, not say, no, you can't do that. You would just say, well, look it, let's have some general statements, some general principles that both of you agree about how the children are going to be raised in the event that you have children. You mean, uh, for example, uh, could the parents agree in a contract what religion their children are going to be or whether they're going to go to a, a French immersion school, for example, or a private school versus public school? Can they put all that in a contract they before can. the children are even born? They can put it in the contract. The real issue is whether or not it's going to govern the actual separation. What happens with a marriage contract on dissolution when you're involving children is that court has a supervisory role over the care of the children. And so I could agree anything I wanted. I could waive the, the rights of my children to any maintenance or whatever. But when it comes down to the court enforcing it and saying, yes, I'm going to do that, lots of these kind of provisions are subject to what happens at the time. You can't and there's a good reason for that, isn't there? I mean, oh, certainly. the court, if, if, if the parties can't agree whenever they break up over what's going to happen to their children, that would be when they'd come to court. Otherwise, if they could agree, me and my colleagues wouldn't see them. 
And so shouldn't the court be making a decision based on the circumstances as they exist at that time that they need the decision made? Well, that, and not maybe 10 years ago or earlier when they entered into this contract before the children were even born? Yeah, well, that's the, po that's the point of what I was saying about uh, there is some crystal ball gazing. But when you're dealing with children in terms of maintenance and access and uh, basically raising issues around children, it's much more focused on when it actually occurs as opposed to what you thought it would be 10 years ago. Yeah, right. I, but the court would still have that agreement. For example, if you, w you were talking about a French immersion school, and let's say the party separating the child's 12 years old, and one of the parties says, no, this child will no longer be in French immersion. You know, I don't like you anymore. I want to do something different. Well, the court will have that agreement and say, well, you, you agreed to this 10 years ago. You followed this agreement. What's changed now? Why is it not in the best interest of this child not to go to a French immersion school now? So, the so it might be relevant. It would it's definitely be. The fact that the parties agreed, and I can tell you in Ontario where I preside, mm -hmm. it's, it's in the legislation that a, a marriage contract or a cohabitation mm -hmm. agreement cannot include issues of custody and access uh, mm -hmm. in advance. You have to deal with that at the time you're, gonna, you're breaking up. But you're saying that even if, you, even if it's not enforceable, a court might be very interested to see that when the parties were getting along way back when, when they entered into the contract, they did agree as parents that this, that this form of education was going to be the, the, the form that the child would, would have. So it might have some, it might have some evidentiary it has, weight. It has an ev evidentiary weight. I mean, but for them, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, you have to understand that what, what a court looks at when they're looking at these issues is the surrounding circumstance. And one of the things that courts are often having trouble with when, they, when you're breaking up is, is separating the... I just want to hurt her or I want to hurt him as opposed to what is actually in the best interest of both parties. And so you, it's easy for the court to step back a bit and say, well, that happened beforehand when they were getting along. They both agreed that that was in the best interest. So as Lee said earlier, what's changed? Why is it different now? If, there's, you know, if there is a reason why it's different, okay. If there's not, then it, it looks more like this is just you know, bad karma. Yeah, out of spite. <laughs> have you ever seen agreements that deal with things that have to do with immigration, for example? like uh, uh, one party having sponsored another party to this country and an agreement that says if we break up, uh, the person who came here gets to go back to whatever country they came from with the child? Uh, I've never had dealt uh, with any of that. I haven't issue. done anything like that either. The, uh, I have dealt with the uh, in people being immigrated in and the requirements under the Immigration Act for supporting the person even after there's a marriage breakup. Um, you can incorporate that in there. I've never seen anyone, or I've never seen a contract that says you can leave the country with the child. Um, we agree to that in advance. So it sounds like, if, I, if I'm understanding this correctly, the major, overwhelmingly important reason uh, or substance of a, of a prenup would be property and money, for the most part. And yeah. is it true, is it possible that sometimes other people will be parties to the contract as well if there's a family business and the assets are jointly owned by the fiancé and parents? Uh, I, sometimes. Yeah, I've never done it that way. Uh, my personal experience has always been the prenup is between the individuals who are entering into the romantic relationships. Uh, I've incorporated the provisions of the prenup into a wider agreement with the corporation that's operating oh, the business. Oh, the provisions of a contract might be part of they another might, contract. They might, they might look in, like they might say that in the event these things happen, it triggers certain provisions under their uh, shareholder agreement, for example. Being rich is complicated. When we come back, we're going to get into questions like, who should get a prenup? How do you know whether you need one? Are second marriages more difficult or less difficult or more important when it comes to prenups, stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back to Family Matters. I'm Justice Harvey Brownstone. We are here with two expert lawyers talking about prenups, Lee Gagnon and Ron Dumonceau. When we left off, we were talking about what gets put in a prenup. What about pensions? Can you agree in advance what's going to happen to each partner's pension if they break up? Well, again, you can agree to almost anything, and that's certainly what pensions is one of the hottest topics of any uh, prenuptial or cohabitation agreement or marriage agreement is basically I get to keep my pension, I earned it, you get to keep your pension, you earned it. The problem is, of course, again, it has to be crystal ball gazing. If down the road one of the parties lost their pension, they could challenge 
the fact that you get to keep your pension free from any claim by the other party. And again, when I say crystal ball gazing, it's, it's very tough because you have to look at the length of the relationship. A prenup, Which you don't know at the beginning. Exactly. A prenup that says, I get to keep my pension, you keep your pension, and the relationship only lasts three or four years, no problem. I think a court wouldn't have any problem upholding that. But if the relation lasts 15, 20 years, and there's an economic disadvantage to one of the spouses, their pension isn't worth nearly as much as the other person's pension, then it becomes a more stickier issue. So prenups become more and more important if it's a short relationship. I'm starting to get the picture here. Tell me, um, is it a good time to get your will done at the same time you get a prenup? Well, it's never a bad time to get your will done. Everybody <laughs> should have a will. Well, yes. it's a good time in the sense that you're, you're examining your economic future and you're, you're trying to figure out what various contingencies. I mean, a breakup of a relationship is just one contingency that you'd be looking at. That's so right. Other things could happen too. Lots of other things can happen. Uh, so it is a good time to look at that. Same thing with uh, medical powers of attorney or even straight full powers of attorney, uh, what you might want to do with those sorts of things as well. Well, guys, I've warmed you up. I've made you feel comfortable, I hope. <laughs> now it's time to get down to the tough question. We did a survey of our studio audience before we started the show, and I asked if anybody in the audience had a prenup, and nobody did. And I have to tell you, as a judge for 15 years, I have never seen one in court. Mm -hmm. We see separation agreements that were entered into when the parties mm -hmm. broke up, but never uh, a prenup. Who is it out there that's getting prenups? Are they movie stars and, 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 and the Donald Trumps of the world? or? Or what? Well, no, I, I'll, again, almost anybody could need a prenup, but it's usually people who are going into second marriages. Second marriages. Who have been through perhaps a disastrous first marriage where they didn't realize what would happen on separation and they lost half their pension. They lost the house that they felt was their house. And so when they're going into a second relationship and they're saying, what do I do or what can I do to protect myself, protect my assets? So they may want to deal with, with their assets and they may deal with the issue of spousal support. Do you agree with that, Ron, that, uh, that, that the there's a large driver. number of people in second marriages? Yeah, the primary drivers that I see are people later in life, not necessarily second marriages, but certainly later in life, uh, more aware of their economics and what, how the economics work on breakups. Uh, the other sort of group of the people that I see are, tend to be the children of people who have, have the same thing. They're entering into their first relationships, but they're 20 years old as opposed to being... 40 years older. But with the second older. marriages, that expression, that once mm -hmm. bitten, twice shy, mm -hmm. sounds like it really happens. It does. It, it really does. does. And so they are coming to you to make sure that they don't f feel like they've lost property if they break up. Well, they're, they're trying to ensure that the property they have mm -hmm. is going to remain theirs and not be subject to a claim by their spouse. And again, that's very difficult to do sometimes when you're drafting it, mm -hmm. when you have to look forward to perhaps this relationship lasting 10, 15 years. So you, you have I to incorporate. It. I get it. But guys, this is the most unromantic thing to talk about before mm -hmm. making a commitment to someone. I cannot imagine the emotional machinations that must go on uh, when um, right after you put the ring on the finger, you know, the diamond, the whole bit, you're on your knees, the flowers you say, would you mind signing this? It's kind of, um, I, I'm, I, can, I can't imagine doing it, and I can't imagine um, the discussion of what happens if we break up. Do you, I mean, you're, you're not acting for both parties, right? Yeah, but no. You never Rarely. get both parties. You cannot Rarely, yeah. go, both parties cannot go to the same lawyer. So you must hear some interesting stories from people saying, uh, we had quite the fight last night. Actually, the, the, what I, when people come into me to talk to me about it, the, what I tell them is it's, it's like going to a marriage counselor or a marriage prep course before you go to get married. The idea of having some discussions about things that are other than. I mean, the reality of living together and being, living in a relationship is very different than the romantic notion that you have when you get into it. And so, no kidding. <laughs> but, it, but as I said, you know, are you if saying you go, that from experience? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but, oh, no. Yes. No, sorry. Am I going to watch this? <laughs> That's right. Do you have a prenup? <laughs> No, I don't. Because you're going to need one with the next yeah, one. Need one. <laughs> but as I said, the, with, with my experience has been a little bit different than that. And since I, I talked to people about this and said, look, at, you should be having these discussions. I mean, irrespective of whether or not you actually enter into a prenup or not. But you don't have get to these see discussions. both parties, do you? 
Well, Do when they I, both come to see you? Not typically, but, I, but I, when I'm briefing my client, I'll tell them about that. Have these discussions because I'm not going to, I'll draft something if you want to, but you know, if you don't have the discussion, just lay the paper in front of her or him, uh, you're not going to get a very good reaction. You know, what you need to do is have the discussion. Well, when do you recommend that couples have this discussion? Uh, after they've set the date? Before? Uh, because, I mean, uh, you know, I'm thinking yeah. of the person watching this show thinking, well, I'm in love. I think it's forever. And, you know, I've got to tell you as a judge, it's very surreal sometimes in a courtroom to remind myself that the people that come in front of me were in love at one mm -hmm. point. Nobody thinks they're going to break up when they get together, mm -hmm. especially if they have children. Mm -hmm. They really did believe it was forever, and yet the people we see are, uh, are, are, have had a real bad time of it. So when do you have the discussion? When you're dating? When you're, you know when that conversation comes around, do you like children? You know, mm -hmm. Can we pick out a pattern? Is that the time? Well, I think you, you need to have it obviously before you get married. If you get married without an agreement, then there's a different, you fall into the legislative uh, regime. Of but you're sort of, certainly not suggesting we do it at the chapel, are you? No, it, it can happen though. But I think what, what we're are trying you, to. What we're, really? <laughs> yes. What, what we're you trying to. You mean the, the discussion gets initiated right before they're walking well, down the aisle? Well, not so much initiated, but one spouse may show up or one uh, spouse to be may show up. Oh, guess what? I'd like you to sign this before we actually tie the knot. And that usually ends the tying of the knot. <laughs> it does. But, but I think what... Now, let me ask you this. That's important. Have you seen cases where the person was uh, under pressure to sign because everybody's there at the wedding and the hair's done, the flowers are wilting, so they sign and then later say, I, 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 was, I was pressured into it? Well, I haven't had a case myself like that, but obviously... The, you might now. The, yeah. you know, the, uh, the court precedents are full of cases where one of the spouses to a prenup or a cohabitation agreement says, well, I was forced, I was coerced, I was there, everything was ready to go. The, well, you know, why the would anybody came. take that risk then? It sounds like that's the worst thing to do, is to spring something like this on your fiancé right before the wedding. They had lousy legal advice. <laughs> you should, so your, your advice to people is never to do that, right? To discuss uh, this well in advance, like at, maybe before you book the band? Yeah, well, people, people are planning <laughs> a life together. I mean, it's, it's part of planning a life together. How are our economics going to work? I mean, it's, like I said, it's no different than planning estate planning I mean, in the sense of you think of it, uh, you know, yes, there is a possibility I will pass on. What's going to happen to my estate if I pass on? Uh, do I have the collection for my Uncle Jim that I want to give to my brother because it's been in the family forever as opposed to giving it to my spouse? I mean, it's no different a discussion. It's just taking into account one of the contingencies that can happen. But the contingency of breaking up is very difficult to talk about without questioning the, uh, how do I put it, how much do you really love me to begin with? If we have to talk about this, if you have, you know, I mean, when mm -hmm. I've talked to people about it, mm -hmm. they say to me, if we need to talk about this, we shouldn't be getting married. Yeah. If you think that it could even happen that we're going to break up, we're not right for each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know what the answer to that is. Well, I, I think that's just an irresponsible way of going about it in the sense of, as I said, it's just another contingency in life. If, if you're going to have a romantic view of life that nothing ever bad is going to happen to you, why do you have a will? You know, why do you buy car insurance? You know, uh, the, the, the reality is that these things happen. If you have a realistic view of life and you, your partner has a realistic view of life, you'll have the discussion. It's not, it doesn't have to be acrimonious. I mean, it's, it's not like these things are built with uh, hate in them. You don't have to be that way at all. You're just talking about what do you want to have happen. Well, if if the money or the property that's in question here is part of a family business or a corporation mm -hmm. that involves other relatives, and I, you know, we've all mm -hmm. seen that, uh, you've got a lot of people at that table talking about what could happen. You know, I mean, I've seen cases yeah. where uh, 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 the, one of the parties is an employee of a family business and is likely going to inherit it. Mm -hmm. And so there's in-laws, future in-laws in the mix. Yeah. See, that it's, that's, uh, I, when I t talk to people about doing that, I don't actually talk to them about that part of it at all because the responsibility for the people is to plan their own lives and how they want their lives to, to unfold and go together. If I was doing it in a wider context in the sense of, okay, they've made these decisions, how am I going to work it into the uh, succession plan of the business? That's when I take that kind of stuff into account. Otherwise, you don't deal with the in-laws? I don't, might I, be actually the pulling the strings? The people, well, if they're instructing, that's a whole different matter. But generally well, do you, speaking, do, not. Can that happen where a, a, a couple 
have re are, are really getting instructions from their seniors, from their parents or grandparents, saying, look, uh, you know, if you want to be able to continue your career in this vein with this business, you have to get a contract. Or we're not going, we're going to change the ownership of this property now. Or change our wills or well, what I've seen not so much in family businesses I, I've had couples you know they've won a million dollars on 649 they want to buy a house for their daughter who happens to be married to mr. X they come to me and say well yes we want to give the house but we really only want to give the house to our daughter so that in the event they break up our daughter gets to keep the house can they do that well Again, you draft the agreement and you try and make it fair and everybody's on the same page, including Mr. X, the husband, and it can, help, it can hold up in court. But Mr. X got a sign on the dotted line that the house that's going to get bought by his in-laws will not be a matrimonial home, I guess, uh, when they break up, it will if not, they break up. It will not be a family And asset. what does that tell Mr. X about what his in-laws think of him? I'm just keeping it real. I, I, I have to tell you, it's really scary uh, that these conversations have to take place. If the in-laws want to buy their daughter that house, they cannot do it any other way. Well, I mean, and I would wonder, what would the daughter say? Well, again, you know, I mean, I'm just thinking here out loud. Um, if, if your spouse comes to you and says, my parents want to buy us a house, but they don't want you to get any part of it if we should break up. Well, you've got a clear message of what they think of you. And I would wonder whether you might say to her, well, and what did you tell your parents? Well, I would say, go for it. I want to live in the house. It's a nice house. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> there, there are you ways. know, there's so yeah. much of human. The, you can't separate the legal from the fact that these are real family matters. Yeah. These are family right. matters. They're big family matters. This is the kind of thing that um, if you flesh it out, can cause unbelievable stress in families. Yeah. The issue always though is, is taking the responsibility to actually do the planning. As I said, you, you, you couldn't just leave it, you can just leave it to, to chance and what might happen. But if you're going to take the responsibility to do it, take the responsibility. I mean, it means having serious discussions. You're, but why, you're with couldn't the, you know, uh, why couldn't the parents say, we're going to buy the house in our names and when we die, we will leave it to our daughter, but they, they can live in it. Uh, either as tenants or just live for free in it, but it'll be ours. Well, they, again, they could do it any way they want. They could, give but the, they could do that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Or they could put a mortgage on the house for the value that they put onto it. But then he'd have to sign that mortgage. Well, he wouldn't get the house if he didn't sign the mortgage. That's the financing for the house. You know, I think that we're as as you talk mm -hmm. about this, it becomes easy to understand why so many people shy away from the conversation. And I wonder how many people. In making their wedding plans, when they're, you know, they, uh, I was kidding about the, you know, the band mm -hmm. and the flowers and all these arrangements you make, including buying a house, I wonder how many people go and see a lawyer uh, as part of their planning to create this economic partnership. You said it was 15% of your practice. What about you? In terms of uh, the actual prenuptial agreements or marriage contracts in that sense, um, I sort of do it on two ends of it. I do a lot of the, uh, the beginning marriage contracts, like the pre what people commonly call a prenuptial agreement. I also do um, a fair number of the separation agreements, mostly because I do tax planning parts of doing that. Uh, when, when people are separating, and they, they can actually do tax planning when they're doing it. Um, well, so I wouldn't say it, it's not a huge part of my practice because I do a lot of other things. But it's but, an important one. So it's an important one. When we come back, we're going to get to the meat and potatoes. What happens when people break up? Do these agreements hold up in court? Or do these agreements cause the breakups? Stay with us. So, when you're entering into a prenup, I take it that to be a legal contract, it's got to be fair. Well, that's the ultimate test. and got to be fair. So how do you make sure the contract's fair? Well, unfortunately, what one party thinks is fair, another party may not think it's fair. So that's where you have to be reasonable and, and basically talk about the terms of what's going to happen. Again, but if two people can't agree on what's fair when they're in love, they're not no enter wonder into a they contract. don't agree with what's fair when they come in front of me. <laughs> well, but what does the law say? How, do you, how does the law measure whether a contract is fair at the time it's entered into? Well, in terms of fairness, you have to look at, at what would happen the next day if the contract needs to be applied. Right. If you separated the next day, is it fair? 
if you separated five years down the road, is it fair? But how do, you make, how do you know if it's fair? I would think you need to know all the details of how much property the other party has. Oh, well, disclosure is always very important when you, disclosure. Uh, yeah, when you do these things. What um, is disclosure? Disclosure essentially is a, just a fair disclosure. In other words, a uh, discussion with the other side about what your actual financial p position is, what you really own, what you really owe. So um, if you're going to enter into a contract, you've got to produce your financial circumstances, financial statements from banks and, 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 and uh, income tax returns, that kind of stuff? You don't actually have to produce it. What you have to be is fair in disclosing it. So like, I don't have to show you my bank statement, but I do have to tell you I have a bank here and it has an approximate balance of this much money. And if you have property, do you have to get it evaluated so that the other party knows how much it's worth? Before uh, they say, yes, I agree, I don't want any share in that summer cottage, yeah. do they need to know that it might be worth half a million? They don't need to know that it might be worth, you know, $565,343, but certainly they should be aware of the approximate value or at least something reasonably close. Uh, for the disclosures that I typically do on the prenup side, they usually just use um, the assessed values, saying this is the assessed value of the property, uh, and from that you can get a pretty good idea of whereabouts the fair market value is. Can you give us a rough idea of what it costs to get a prenup? Well, again, as I said earlier, prenups can be very, very simple. Mm -hmm. Well, the or typical the, one that you would do I would uh, say, with people that clearly have some kind of money, uh, especially the second marriages where they've, they, they're, they're middle-aged, they've got property, they've got pensions. 1000 to $2,000. It depends how many hours you put into it. Yeah. Do you get charged by the hour when you do a prenup? I do. Uh, so there's an hourly rate that you pay a lawyer. Yeah, I do you mind me asking, like, what's the range? Yeah, I don't typically charge an hourly rate. I typically look at it uh, more of a piecework. The range is about right, but uh, so I So what's the hourly rate range? Well, my hourly rate is $250 an hour, so if it takes four hours, then you've got $1,000 plus your HST and disbursement, so it so, adds up. Uh, so Lee does it by the hour, and you say typically it's about between one and $2,000. Yeah, it could take anywhere from four to six to seven hours, depending on how complicated and how detailed they want the agreement to be. I can do a prenup in an hour and a half if it's pretty simple and straightforward. And then, Ron, you do it by the total price. I do it as a more a piece. of a piecework. Uh, so, what's thing. the roughly the general? Uh, about the range. same thing. Uh, for me, it, what I look at in terms of the uh, d dissolution, I, I look at mostly for tax planning reasons. So how much tax planning I have to put into doing the, the separation, um, and you know what kind of tax effects might arise because when you have these things, you're talking about disposing of assets, which can all trigger all kinds of tax effects. So. The more tax planning that goes into it, the more costly it is. But that's just what one party had to pay, because you're not representing both parties. So one party's got paid probably between a thousand and two thousand dollars. The other partner has to go to another lawyer, who's going to represent them. And then, do the two lawyers negotiate something? Because well, in the end of the day, you're going to yeah. get one contract. How is it drafted? There could be a lot of negotiation. There could yeah. be a lot of toing and froing, saying, "No, no, we disagree with this. We think this is more fair." And then it, it's, a, it's a, a bit of a tug of war, if you will, to use one of your expressions. Love uh, that term. <laughs> on, on lawyers saying, well, we're trying to meet in the middle, trying to reach a compromise that both parties can accept. Maybe both parties may not like it, but they're prepared to accept it. Yeah. it my experience has been more that uh, I typically would do the drafting and then uh, present it uh, to the other side. But it, I generally speaking would have a long discussion with my partner or excuse my client, about what exactly has to go into it and how, how to do it. And then it's presented to the other side and go seek legal advice with respect to it. So um, what if they break up? What happens? Is it fair to say that in, in most cases, one of the parties is going to want the contract to be upheld and the other one would like it to be set aside? Is that fair? No, I, I don't think that that's fair. I mean, those are the ones that go to court, but I think there's many, many, many cases where the parties are satisfied at the end of the relationship yeah, this contract works. I, I agree to it, and I'm going to abide by it. The ones that don't work are maybe the ones that, weren't, that didn't incorporate um, enough crystal ball gazing for depends on the length of the relationship. Because if it, if it ends and one party is at an economic disadvantage, that's where they say, well, I need to try and set aside this contract. Well, can you guarantee to people that this contract that they're, that they're paying two thousand dollars each maybe for will be upheld you can't guarantee that no isn't that what they want from you a guarantee 
They may want it, but they ain't going to get it. Yeah. There's, no, there's no way that you can give them a guarantee. But so what's the, how do you make sure that it's as enforceable as possible? You don't know how long they're going to stay together, and you don't know what's going to happen to their money or their property mm -hmm. as their relationship evolves. How do you make this uh, airtight? Well, the thing you do, again, is you, you have to do crystal ball gazing, and you have to incorporate. You say, for example, in terms of property, they say one, one party's got a million dollars in assets, the other party's got zero. You can incorporate and say, okay, after five years, if we're still together, you get a 10% interest in my assets, no matter what they are. And then you kind of incorporate that as a fairness scale. The longer the relationship, the greater the entitlement the other spouse has to the asset mix. So you, you have to incorporate that. Obviously, if you say, this million dollars and everything that grows from this million dollars, it will remain mine and you will never have a piece of it, even though we live together and have a relationship that lasts 20 years. Of so course, you're getting back to it. the fairness. Yeah. It, 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 one way to make it fair is to make sure that if there's, a, if, if there's a, an imbalance in the wealth of the parties when they're getting together, that some wealth gets transferred throughout the relationship to the party that's less wealthy. Yeah. That's one way to do it? Well, what Lee's actually talking about is, is there's two kinds of growth on those sorts of assets. You have sort of the basic asset that sits there, it's a million dollars, but there's inflationary growth and there's natural interest growth that goes on top of that. Um, if you look at it in terms of what has been earned while you're apart as opposed to what's been earned while you're together, um, the, the growth of the asset has been earned while you're together. And it goes back to the idea that as an economic partnership, you're entitled to the benefits of the economic partnership. So the, um, lots of times you look in, in terms of that kind of a split saying, uh, I had a million dollars to begin with when I started. I get to keep my million dollars, but it might be worth two million ten years from now. Well, you're entitled to part of that two million because it, uh, it's part of the growth that we had when we were together. So can you tell us, what, have you seen a common theme in the cases that end up in court? What situations seem to generate uh, a, a litigation over... Uh, upholding a contract when someone else wants to set it aside? Was it bad legal advice? Was it greediness? Was it uh, unfairness at the beginning that they didn't disclose the true value of what they owned? Well, I, I think it's more unfairness at the end depending on the length of the relationship. I mean, if, if you've done it right, your contract should be good at the beginning. Because, I mean, in my mind, as a lawyer, it's not unfair that if I own a million dollars in assets, and I'm hooking up with you that you don't, and you've got basically nothing, that perhaps if this relationship only lasts a year, you shouldn't get 50% of my million dollars. To me, that's fair. And I think if the person that I'm hooking up with doesn't agree with that, then maybe I don't need, I want to hook up with that person. Do you have clients that sometimes say, you know what, we're calling this relationship off? The negotiation I've, process was so, uh, gave me a picture into this person that I thought I knew and now I realize I don't know them at all because they're greedy. They want my million dollars. Does that happen? It's never happened to me. Never happened to me either. So nobody breaks up as a result of coming to see you? Not, not, I haven't had that experience but I'm sure it has happened. Yeah. But you never find out about it. No, Did I, you get paid? Oh yeah. Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> No, so do you see any themes? I, I, it sounds like the big theme is unfairness. You've got to yeah. be fair and you've got to be uh, willing to share. And it, is that fair? Like I say, it's got to be fair at the beginning, but it also has to be fair at the end. And that's the difficult part of drafting these agreements mm -hmm. is trying to make them fair at the end because you don't know if there, first of all, if there's going to be an end, but if there is an end, how does the agreement work? If the agreement works today after a 15-year relationship that party A has 5 million and party B only has 500,000, well, party B may say, well, that's not fair. Well, so is there, is there a category of people that don't need this? I mean, if you don't have a million dollars, if it's a young couple and they're both starting out and they don't have much, they just got out of school, they're both at the same level economically, do they need a prenup? I, not necessarily. Yeah. I would look more at the, um, the whole family circumstance because if uh, one person comes from the Rockefellers and one person comes from the wrong side of the tracks, uh, it's quite conceivable that there's going to be a different, notwithstanding they don't have anything to begin with. Um, if one came from the Rockefellers and the other came from the other side of the tracks, mm -hmm. I want to go to that wedding. <laughs> <laughs> and I know which side of the yeah. tracks I'm going to sit That's on. Right. <laughs> but it's not about me. Yeah. I just think that um, there are some people that just may not need it. 
Well, but uh, you're the experts. Do you, do, should, do, should every, would you tell your children to get prenups before they get married? I wouldn't necessarily tell them to get a prenup, but I would tell them to educate themselves about what they're getting in economically. Yeah. If they decide to get married or if they decide to cohabit, yes, it's all about love. We're in love. Everything's going to be great. But what happens if it doesn't work out? Yeah. What does the law say? And do you want to go with the law or do you want to maybe have an agreement in advance prior to starting your relationship that sets out this is what's going to happen? Well, but, in our remaining minutes, I want to give you a chance to tell us, have you had any horror stories that have happened? Any, any war stories you want to share? Well, I'll tell you the one story that, I, that actually isn't a horror story at all. It was a, quite a lovely story. I had a second marriage. Uh, both parties uh, were business people and they got together and they... It was one of the first three numbers contracts I ever did. And uh, about probably 15 years later, they came into my office and gave it to me and they said, rip it up in front of us because we're having a celebration. And so tore it all up in, in front of them. And they, Did they, you give them a refund? No, no. <laughs> See, that we would have been heartwarming. No, we went, out, we went out afterwards and had some champagne, and it was, but it was Isn't quite that nice. nice? I bet you never see that very often. No. But what about situations that you think people could learn from? Any key messages you want us to get? This may be the only show, it's certainly the only show I've ever seen that deals with this topic. Well, I think if you, and the key message is if you're going to enter in any kind of agreement, make sure it's fair and reasonable. And that's not necessarily an easy thing to do. I think my key message that I would tell people is even if you're not going to actually enter into the agreement, have the discussions. Talk about this. Talk about it as a contingency. Have the discussions so we have a realistic idea of what might happen. Uh, even if you're not intending actually to enter into the agreement, at least have the discussion so you understand what could happen, what might happen, and what you, want, what you think will happen. Now, during the break, you were telling me that you see relationships as a kind of a bank account. Well, it's, it's an analogy I use lots of times when I'm talking to people. When they get into a romantic relationship, I see it as a bank balance. In good times, you're both putting money in. In bad times, you're both taking money out. The trouble is you're not always having good times and bad times together. So when, when relationships tend to break down, somebody's getting out from a huge loan because they, they've taken all their capital out and, and somebody's losing a bank balance. So you get people who are hurt and, and hurtful because they lost something and people are very relieved because they've got out of something. And it tends to put people in very different positions when they uh, leave relationships. Emotionally? Emotionally, I'm talking about. Not, You're not talking about an emotional, an emotional bank account. Emotional bank account that and so how do. does that analogy relate to prenups? Well, what it is is that you Sounds don't get... Sounds like you should get a GIC. Well, what ends up happening is that people, if, if you're looking at it in terms of how you do it, you're, you're taking a clear mind to begin with to decide how to deal with it at the end of it, as opposed to trying to react out of a situation where you are either relieved that you're finally away from this thing or you've lost something dear to you. And people don't make rational decisions when they're under that kind of pressure. You know what? After having listened to this today, I think this is a conversation that every single couple before they live together or get married, should have. Whether they enter into a prenup or not, the conversation about what should happen if is not a bad one to have. I have found this conversation fascinating. I'm very grateful to you for coming and sharing your expertise with us. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. From all of us here at Family Matters, thank you and see you next time.